Well, once again, I would call your attention this time to Romans chapter 10. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, once again, we, we find it a mighty, mighty privilege to be able to sit under the, the teaching of your word. And Lord, as we again continue to follow Paul through his letter to the Romans, we ask that you give understanding and give grace. Uh, Lord, that we would be doers of the word, not just hearers. Lord, that the words that you will speak to us through Paul will call us ever closer to yourself, to a greater and more humble walk with you, and Lord, to a, um, a greater desire to see you magnified amongst men and women and boys and girls. We thank you that you have called us to be your children. And we rejoice in that truth, in that great privilege. So help us, Father, to respond with our entire life in a way that brings honor and glory to you. Use this scripture today to do that in our lives. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And those words are among the most well known in the entire letter to the Romans. It would not be wrong to say that along with perhaps two or three other verses in the Bible that these words have had as mighty an impact on evangelism and missions than any in the New Testament. Here we have the statement that faith, that is believing faith, cannot exist apart from the word of God. Indeed, it is true to say that we would not have the slightest notion of the true nature and character of God without the revelation of his word. And of course, that truth is seen in those cultures where the word of God has never been heard. Missionaries enter a previously unreached uh, region only to discover that the people of that region are in fact religious. They have an ingrained knowledge of the spiritual realm. They have a, a spiritual awareness of God. And we know that's true because God states that he has placed that knowledge in every person. Men are made in the image of God. And that image was not erased by the fall. It is now a distorted image, a fatally damaged image, but men still know that there is something, someone that is greater than themselves outside of themselves. But because of their fallen nature, and because they do not have the word of God to give them light, without this light they seek to answer the inner witness by inventing a god or gods of their own imagination some of which are benign and others quite terrifying. But in whatever form it takes, man-made religion is always lacking. It is always missing the mark. Paul speaks of this in the first chapter, and he says that men have essentially abandoned the true God uh, in favor of false gods, and they make themselves all kinds of images made in the, in the form of men or of even animals or even of insects, and they, they worship them, they worship snakes, and they worship the sun and the moon and the stars. They worship the creation instead of the creator. Some of them worship the spirits of their dead ancestors. Some see demons behind every bush and spend their entire lives appeasing these demons. Others, perhaps a bit closer to the truth, worship the, the great spirit, or the great unseen God. And of course, even in sophisticated Athens, Paul came across that very thing, didn't he? He was walking along, there was all these monuments and, and temples, and there was one to the unknown God. And of course, Paul uh, took that and beautifully said, this God whom you do not know, I proclaim unto you. But one does not have to live in an ancient or primitive society to find all kinds of religious responses to this inner witness that God has placed in every person. The world is full of people who worship a god or multiple gods, even those who deny such a god. Whatever one substitutes for the true god, in fact, becomes a god, a false god. 
False gods do not have to be made of metal or wood or stone. They can be made of green paper. Secularism and materialism and selfism are all forms of belief systems that qualify as religion. Last month when Mickey and I were in England, I turned on the TV to watch the Barcelona versus Manchester United Championship Game of Europe, the best team in Europe, usually considered perhaps the best team in the world as well. Sadly, Barcelona beat Manchester United thoroughly, taught them a lesson. And I saw thousands of grown men weep because of that. Thousands of grown men weep. It's only a game, isn't it? No, it's not only a game to them. It's a religion that promises excitement and satisfaction and glory. And when it fails, what happens? It brings despair. And false gods always do that. They promise much and they always fail and bring despair. They promise more than they can deliver. Increasingly in our modern age, which has been contaminated by the junk science of Darwinism, some seek an escape from this inner witness that won't go away by denying it. They push it away. They say, there is no such thing as a God. There is no God. And so they declare atheism. Atheism is cruel right now, especially in the under-35 crowd. People who have been indoctrinated in our public school systems and, and just in the general society around us that is abandoning a creator God for the, the junk science of Darwinism. One report, by the way, I read just a couple of days ago is that those who profess atheism in that under 35 age group has increased from 9% in 1999 to 17% today. That's a massive decline in, uh, in just a decade. Now, without going into the the real details of such a a report, one wonders just how serious they are. But the fact is that there is a movement away from God in this nation and in the world in general. Uh, But because we live in this nation, we can see it. Uh, Some people, of course, run away from conscience by attempting to drown that nagging voice in all kinds of worldly pleasures, distractions. But you know it haunts them. It haunts them in the night. It haunts them in their lonely hours. And in the days of discouragement when all seems meaningless, that voice sometimes speaks very loudly and insistently. The older one gets, usually the inner voice is heard more frequently. And as one approaches death, it often makes itself powerfully known. You know, we're going to Bury Clarence Eliason on Wednesday, 98 years old, died four days after his 98th birthday. But we baptized him here last year, just shortly after his 97th birthday. And he's home with the Lord now. What a blessing, a real blessing. But each, you know, in its own way, each false religion promises to silence the troublesome inner witness to the one true God. And it does so by substituting something of apparent value, something that appeals to the feelings of the intellect, but it misses the vital center of humanity, the heart, the soul. None of these false gods or false religions can lead anyone to know the true God. Even the Jewish people who did have an intellectual grasp of God, they had an emotional passion, a zeal for God, were lacking in the one thing most necessary to know God. A true understanding of the word of God in their heart. They had the scriptures, they had the laws, they had the promises, but they missed the meaning of them all. Look at what Paul says in Romans chapter 10 and verse Verses 2 through 4. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. 
For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. The Jews had everything that they needed except genuine, heartfelt faith. And not having faith in Christ, they did not have the righteousness that they sought. For that to happen, they needed to hear the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. They had that word of God. What were they missing? They needed to hear it in a new way. They needed to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, whom all the scriptures pointed to. All the Old Testament that they so loved and so were so determined to keep pointed to Christ. They hadn't heard that. So in order for them to hear, they needed someone to explain it to them. For that to happen, someone must take it to them and to others who had not heard. And that's exactly what Paul says in verse 14. How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? How shall they Hear without a preacher. How shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. That, of course, was what the Apostle Paul was all about. Taking the tidings of good things to those who did not understand, to those who had never heard. As a matter of fact, when he wrote this letter to the Romans, do you know what he was planning to do? He was planning to go on a mission trip to Spain. Take a quick look at Romans chapter 15, beginning in verse 20. And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation, But as it is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see. And those who have not heard shall understand. For this reason I also have been much hindered from coming to you. But now no longer having a place in these parts, and having a great desire these many years to come to you, whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. For I hope to see you on my journey, and to be helped on my way there by you, if first I may enjoy your company for a while." At the time that Paul wrote this letter, some 25 years had passed since Pentecost and probably 20 years since Paul's personal conversion. What had he been doing during that time? Preaching the gospel faithfully, commencing with the Jews who, for the most part, rejected it. The message of a crucified Messiah was simply unthinkable to the Jews who expected that he would be the very opposite of that. He would be a conquering hero that Jesus of Nazareth, whom they considered to be a mere man and not of a very good pedigree at that, was proclaimed to be the Messiah, and not only proclaimed to be the Messiah, but proclaimed to be the Son of the living God, was nothing short of blasphemy. And so Jesus became, as the prophet Isaiah had foretold, a stumbling block to the Jews. Although a considerably larger number of Gentiles had received Christ as Savior upon hearing the gospel, the message of a crucified Savior who had risen from the dead seemed to them as nothing but foolishness. Foolishness. So it would seem that the good news of the gospel was not good news to the vast majority of both Jews and Gentiles. This being the case, it might well be asked, why are so few saved, or perhaps why are any saved at all? With Paul, we have looked at this question from a theological view in the first half of letter to the Romans. The answer to the Holy Spirit, of the Holy Spirit is this, that people are saved by grace through faith in God apart from works. They are saved because God chose them to be saved in eternity past. He did so according to his own good pleasure, and without any external influence of any kind. Having chosen them in eternity, God calls them in time through the proclamation of the gospel. And when the gospel is proclaimed to them, it comes to them not in word only, but also in power 
and in the Holy Spirit. The Ruah, the breath of God, breathes into them new life and creates new life in them and causes them to be born again. Being born again, they see the kingdom of God. Unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, Jesus said. But being born again, they see the kingdom of God and receive it by faith. That by faith of the word of God created in them and they are saved. That's the divine aspect of salvation, isn't it? But there's also a practical aspect of this. The human aspect, the human aspect, the human interaction, if you will, that must take place. The human involvement of a preacher, the human involvement of a hearer, and the responsibility of both. And that's where Paul has been heading in the 10th chapter. The word of God must be preached. And it must be heard and received in order for anyone to be saved. In order for anyone to be saved, they must hear the word of God and must call out to God. And some do. Most don't. So why don't they? Is it the fault of the preacher? Have preachers failed in their responsibility to get the word out? Could it be that even if the word has gone out, it's not gone out with sufficient clarity? Is the word of God unclear? What is the problem? And that's the question that Paul answers in our passage for this morning. Let's take our text now. Romans 10, 17 through 21. Actually, just go back to 16, 16 through 21. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, did Israel not know? First, Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. But to Israel, he says, All day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Now, I want to take a look at this passage in two ways. The first of how it relates to the Jews and to the Gentiles of the first century, how it relates to those to whom it was first written. So first we'll look at it exegetically or expositionally, if you will. And then a continuation of that is how it relates us to, to us today because there is in every scripture an application, isn't there, for people in every age. So secondly, I want to look at it in terms of application specifically in regards of preaching and witnessing. Now, we know that it is the gospel that does the work of salvation. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The power of God does not, is not in the preacher. It's in the message. It's, in, it's not in the preacher. It's in the message. But, and this is important, The gospel has to be presented to people and in such a way that the method of presentation and the one presenting it don't mess it up. So what might we find in this passage for Christians that would help us to reach the unsaved who, as we have described earlier, are following the ways of the world and and worshipping, perhaps ignorantly, at the altars of so many false gods? What is it that will enable us to gain a hearing for the gospel? I think this is where Paul is is also going, apart from just speaking to the Jews. So let's take a look at it first exegetically, 17 and 18. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. The sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Well, the they encompasses all men, both Jew and Gentile. I think here 
the they of this passage is clearly focused on Israel because that's where the context would uh, lead us. For the most part, the Jews had rejected the gospel and we know the theological reasons for that, the claims of Jesus. But could it possibly be that the reason that so many Jews remained unconverted was based on the fact that they had in fact not had any opportunity to hear the gospel, living perhaps in a little village somewhere where the gospel had never gone. But I say, have they not heard? How does Paul answer? Well, he quotes from Psalm 19, 1 through 4. We are familiar with that psalm, but let's take a quick look at it. Psalm 119, 1 through 4. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. The line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun. Now, It would seem strange to us that Paul would choose this particular verse to illustrate what he plans to say uh, to the Jews. So we must be very careful not to confuse general revelation and special revelation. In Romans 1.20, Paul uses the same psalm to declare that men everywhere, and by that is meant globally, that men everywhere are without excuse. No one can say that there is no God because all creation cries out and testifies that there is a God and all instinctively know it because God has placed that inner witness in every person that that he exists. But general revelation is not sufficient to save. It gives us the knowledge of God. It doesn't tell us much about God and it doesn't tell us anything about the plan of salvation. If general revelation were sufficient to save, Christianity would not be necessary at all. Christian mission would be unnecessary. But because general revelation does not give sufficient information, special revelation is required. Special revelation is the word of God that tells us about God, his character, his nature, Special revelation tells us about man, his character, his nature, the fall, sin. And it tells us about God's plan of salvation. People need to hear that. Specifically, they need to hear about Jesus, the crucified and risen Savior. Because unless they hear about him, they cannot be saved. Acts 4.12, there is no other name. No other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. You must know about Jesus. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God about Jesus. Had the Jews had opportunity to hear that particular message? Paul says that they have. Yes, indeed, he says. Yes, indeed. And he uses Psalm 19's statement about nature's universal testimony to God as an illustration that the gospel has been proclaimed in all the regions where Jews live. This does not mean that every single Jewish person had heard the gospel, just like everyone in the world today who lives, has ever heard heard it. Not everyone in our modern world of sophisticated communications has yet heard the gospel. I was reading in a missions publication just a few days ago that it is estimated there are still around 2,500 people groups that have not a single witness. There are tribes and subsets and sub-tribes of 10, 20, 30, 40,000 people, not a single witness. There are some places in northern India where there are subgroups of 100,000 people, one Christian, perhaps two. There's virtually no witness. And yet people cannot be saved without that witness. 
In fact, millions, we might even say billions, have lived on the earth and died without ever hearing the gospel. So what Paul is saying here, he's not saying that in quoting Psalm 19, he's not saying that the gospel, the saving gospel, has gone out all over the world. Clearly, it hadn't. What Paul has in mind is, is that in the years since Pentecost, no region in the world, and the context of, is the world that he knew about, the world that he was familiar with, that no region in the world has been untouched by the gospel. He could not have known about Australian Aborigines or, or Eskimos or the hundreds or thousands of other people groups that lived in parts of the world that they didn't know exist. So Paul is speaking within his, his, within his own historical context, the Middle East and parts of Europe. Within that region, Paul is saying the gospel has gone out. It's gone out. It's gone out to those main centers of, of, of Jewish population. The Jews are without excuse. Well, then perhaps they just didn't understand it. But I say, did Israel not know, Paul says? Perhaps they just didn't understand it. Perhaps it was not communicated clearly enough. Now, Paul's answer is not direct, but it illustrates the problem. The problem, Paul says, is not with the message. The problem is with you. It's not ignorance, it's unwillingness. That's the problem. And he quotes Deuteronomy 32.15. So let's take a look at that. Deuteronomy 32.15 through 21. Deuteronomy 32.15. But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You grew fat, you grew thick, you are obese. Then he forsook God who made him and scornfully esteemed the rock of his salvation. They provoked him to jealousy with foreign gods. With abominations they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons, not to God. To gods they did not know. To new gods, new arrivals, that your fathers did not fear. Of the rock who begot you, you are unmindful, and have forgotten the God who fathered you. When the Lord saw it, he spurned them, because of the provocation of his sons and his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be. For they are a perverse generation, children in whom is no faith. They have provoked me to jealousy by what is not God. They have moved me to anger by their foolish idols. But I will provoke them to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move them to anger by a foolish nation." Here we see the root of Israel's problem. Unbelief in spite of repeated blessings. Their unbelief provoked the Lord to righteous anger, to jealousy. And he responded by turning his face away from them. There will be more about this in chapter 11. Where we see that God not only turns away from them, but he hardens them and cuts them off for a period. In simple terms, God is giving them a taste of their own medicine. They provoked him to jealousy and anger, and he will do the same to them. For what purpose? To punish and to redeem. To punish all, and then to redeem some. And let's just take a quick look at the first few verses of uh, of uh, chapter 11 because this really is very, very tightly controlled by the context. I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. And I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Paul adds two quotes from Isaiah to this one in Deuteronomy. 
First is in verse 20. Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found by them who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask me. But to Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. The whole history of Israel, from the first advent of Christ to the second coming, can be explained by this particular action of God. He has turned away from the nation and turned to those who did not know him and who worshipped other gods. The God that the Jews thought belonged exclusively to them and who was concerned exclusively with them, whom they had taken for granted and abused, has now poured out his grace upon the Gentiles. Those people the Jews considered as unclean dogs were now the recipients of God's gracious and merciful love. God does this because he loves sinners, be they Jews or Gentiles, but he does it also to make Israel jealous. He wants them to get, he wants them to feel the distance. And you know this in your own life, don't you? When you have backslidden and you've fallen away from, from God, you feel the distance. And you miss the fellowship of the saints. And you miss prayer. You miss reading the word. And it gets to be unbearable, doesn't it? And you, what do you do? You come back. There was a time when Mickey and I were dating. And I took her for granted. You know what she did? She dated another man. Made me jealous. And I got the message and came back quickly. I got in line. God has many ways to win his beloved. And if his gentle, loving, genuine concern fails, all day long I have stretched my hands to a disobedient and contrary people, he will work another way. He still does. So that's the exposition. What's the application? What does this mean in terms of presenting the gospel and winning the lost? What is going to turn the Manchester United fan who cries when his team is beaten? Or the Red Sox fan or the Bruins fan or someone who is besotted with money? What is going to turn them away from their false god? What is going to catch the eye of someone whose life has been wrecked by sexual infidelity or by various kinds of addictions, maybe to alcohol or to, or, to, uh, or to drugs or to gambling? What will satisfy the person who has everything in this world and yet is empty inside? What will rescue those who are trapped in a cult or a false religion or even those who profess to be atheists? What's going to rescue them? What's going to turn them towards God? It is the promise of something better. The promise of something better. It has to in some way make them jealous, make them envious that they are missing out on something which is far better than what they have. That they're missing out on a full life. What is it? Well, better, who is it? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the good news of forgiveness. It's a cleansing from unrighteousness. It's freedom from sin's controlling power. This something better is not the false doctrine of the health and wealth crowd. It is not the false promise that life will be a bowl of cherries if you become a Christian. Indeed, the testimony that there is something better may very be well be made to the person who has everything by someone who has nothing in this world. And yet they have one thing, that something indefinable, that something wonderful, that something glorious that the person who has everything needs and wants desperately. But he just doesn't know what it is. It may well be made to a physically healthy person by a person who is chronically ill. How do the saints, whom some consider to be the offscouring of the world, make people jealous? I believe this passage tells us three ways. The first is this, by the obedience of faith. Verse 16. 
but they have not all obeyed the gospel. Obeyed the gospel. Last part of verse 21. To a disobedient and contrary people. The problem with Israel and with all those who are unsaved is disobedience to God. It was the first problem, wasn't it? That's why Adam and Eve fell into sin. Disobedience. That is the mark of the unsaved. The mark of the saved is what? It is the very opposite. It is gospel obedience, faithful obedience, albeit not perfect obedience, but it is a person who is obedient to the gospel. By that I mean a person whose life is in line with the word of God, who is progressing in the ways of God, who is led by the spirit of God and who has a genuine desire to be conformed to the image of Christ. My friends, that it is an irresistible attraction. Because such people are different in every category of life. They have different values, different interests, different speech, different hopes. They spend their time and their resources in ways that are different. There is something about them which both draws and repels almost at the same time. And some may be scared away by the holiness of such a person because that's what it is. It's a person who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit who is living a life that is controlled by the Holy Spirit and that person is considered holy by God and is becoming holy in the process of sanctification. And that is a contradiction in today's world. It's like a a white splotch of paint on a black wall. Your eyes are instantly drawn to it. You cannot miss it. And as I said, said, some, it draws, draws others, it repels. What did did Paul say? We are a savor of life unto life to some and death unto death to others. What should should such a person look like? I think Peter, listen to what Peter says in 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16. You know these verses. 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. They see that you have something they don't have. Hope. Why do you have hope? What is it about you? Why are you different? And then he says, with meekness and fear. Answer them with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revalue your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. Gospel obedience is the master mark of Christianity. There are many in our churches who lack this mark. They identify as Christians, but their lives call their profession into question, if not doubt. Such a person may be a hypocrite, having just a profession of faith, but no possession of it. Such a person may be backslidden, in need of repentance and restoration. But in either case, because their lives lack the sanctification that Christ demands, their testimony, when and if it is given, is marred by their actions. See, it simply boils down to this. We can't sell what we don't have. We can't give away what we don't possess. Only eternity will tell how many people have been put off Christianity by what they see in the lives of professing Christians. No one, no one will be jealous of your relationship with Christ. No one will want what you say you have if your life is is not demonstrably different from what they see elsewhere. I think there's a real challenge to parents here. Do your children see Christ in you? Do they want what you have or are they just biding their time until they're old enough to leave? What does such a life look like? Paul addresses this in a number of places, but one of the places I find very helpful is Ephesians chapter 5. And I'd like you to turn there. 
Ephesians 5, we're going to read the first eight verses. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. That's a tall order, isn't it? Be imitators of God as dear children. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given us himself an offering, a sacrifice to God, a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as fitting for saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them, for you were once darkness, But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Walk as children of light. Such a life of gospel obedience will create a holy jealousy, a longing for something better and an opportunity for the gospel. Gospel obedience. Second, by a convincing testimony. Verse 20. I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. There are as many conversion stories as there are Christians. Every conversion story is unique. Some come to faith in a dramatic fashion, as did Paul. Some come to faith quickly, as I did. Others come much more slowly. Nicodemus is an example of that. Some of you in this room uh, did not come to Christ just instantly like that. It was, it was a process by which you came. But the commonality is this. All who come to Christ are drawn out of sin. All who come to Christ are drawn out of selfishness, are drawn out of the world and into the family of God. And for all who come to Christ, one thing is common. We see it as an amazing miracle. And we say, why, why me? Why me? It's an amazing miracle. The question is this, and it should, we should be asked of us every day, we should ask it of ourselves every day. Do I see this conversion to Christ, do I see belonging to him as an amazing miracle in my life? And if it, if it is, does it show? Do you tell others about it? Are you convinced that your salvation is amazing? That you find it astonishing that God has saved you. Is that your story? I never cease to be amazed that I'm a Christian. I had no thoughts of becoming a Christian. No desire to follow Jesus. The thought that I would be in church as often as I am, tithing my income, considering a potluck supper to be the highlight of my week, gathering a bunch of men to study the Bible and pray would have resulted in a profound embarrassment to me if I'd entertained any thoughts like that. And I would, of course, never have entertained them. But now I take joy in what I formerly disdained. Does being a Christian bring you joy? Or is it matter of fact, ho-hum, nothing special, no big deal? My friends, there is no bigger deal. There is no bigger deal. There is hardly anything in this world that is more contradictory than a joyless Christian and hardly anything more likely to turn someone away from Christianity than a joyless Christian. What's to be envious about that? What's to be envious about someone who complains all the time? Who's talking about me all the time? Woe is me. Everything's wrong. What's to be envious about that? Nothing. People want to go away from you. Now, we cannot manufacture joy. We don't put on a false face and say everything's fine if it isn't. Truth must reign. But if we see our salvation as an amazing gift of God, then there will be joy despite whatever circumstances we might be living in. Godliness with contentment. Great gain. And such a Christ-like attitude is a convincing testimony 
that will cause people to want what you have. It will promote holy jealousy. How are we to win those who are worshipping false gods of this world? By gospel obedience, by convincing testimony, and thirdly, by a sincere love for the lost. Look at God's sincerity here. Verse 21. All day long I've stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Still does that, of course. Still gathering in his elect. Still gathering them in. When I was in seminary, an experienced pastor said this to me, and I'll never forget it. He said, your congregation, the people in your congregation, will easily forget your greatest sermon. They'll easily forget your greatest sermon. But they will always remember the simple prayer when you visited them in the hospital. They'll always remember that. He was right. The same is true for every Christian. We cannot be just mouthpieces. As indispensable as the word of God is for salvation... That word must be proclaimed, preached, taught, and witnessed in genuine love. People need to know that we care enough about them to tell them the truth, even if the truth hurts them. They need to know that, that we love them enough. Loving them does not mean that we cater to them, we don't pander to them. Our aim is not to make them happy, it's to make them holy. There's often a big difference between those two. Holiness does have its own kind of happiness or joy. Your tongue may be all verbal thumbs and the gospel may just stumble out of your mouth, but they will overlook that if they know you love them and you care for their soul. God gave grace and salvation to the Gentiles so that he would make the Jews jealous. He has saved you and me so that we might make others jealous in our turn. We are to be obedient to the faith, have a convincing testimony, and love those to whom we speak. Amen. Let us pray. Father, it is our desire this morning that you will teach us by your word, that you will take these words which we have spoken from your word and which you have spoken through me, And Lord, use them in each of us to draw us ever closer to Christ. Use them in each of us to draw us ever more into his image. That we would be faithful to you, obedient to your word, which we know is perfect and good. That Lord, you would help us to speak convincingly to those who are lost. And as we do, Lord, that they might know that we care for their souls. Father, we ask that you would bless us today. And if there be one or more here today, Lord, who has never really become a child of God, they have a a profession of faith, but there is no possession. Lord, they, they know that they're hypocritical. Father, I just pray that you would, as only you can by your Spirit, Open them up to the truth. Draw them to Christ. For this we pray in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen.